Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back and in this episode we're going to continue to work on the race car and more specifically the front suspension. We are going to look at all the different elements that make up the front suspension. We'll take it apart and we'll check it for metal fatigue, wear and tear and anything else that could be wrong with the front suspension. But we're also going to talk about caster, camber, toe in, toe out. So these are very critical elements when you're doing the geometry of the car. I'm not going to align the car right now, but we'll have a long talk on all these different elements and see where we can adjust this on this car and how this suspension is really built and why they build it this way on this car. I was really hoping that in this episode I could rebuild the brakes, but my spare parts haven't arrived, except the new main brake cylinders. And I got those from OBP uh, Motorsport, uh, which is a company in Sweden, and I got this within two days for a very good price. So these are the new master brake cylinders that we will put up in the next episode, together with the rebuild of the calipers. And the main purpose of a suspension is to keep the wheels on the tarmac so they should be able to move up and down but they should always stay in touch with the tarmac that's the first role of your suspension the second role of the suspension is to make sure that the contact surface of the tire is always as maximum as possible so the suspension system must manage the tires so let's start with the tires and the wheels now i'm going to make a separate video on the tires but the wheel should be spinning around a spindle or a bearing or the wheel bearing. And this car has a pretty good bearing on it. It's, it's not uh, loose, it has no play on it. And in fact, when I rotate the wheel, it doesn't make any annoying sound or grinding sounds. Um, so that's good. Um, if you rotate it by hand, you can feel on the tire and you can feel if there was a worn out bearing. You could actually hear it and you could actually feel it. So that is pretty good. So what I'm going to do now is to take the wheel off and then we have a look on that spindle or that bearing. And here is the actual spindle or the wheel bearing, which is bolted down with four bolts towards the upright and I already have removed the brake discs in a previous episode. So now we're going to remove uh, this spindle. And these are the bolts that are holding the wheel bearing and there's four of them. I already removed two, so not to take too much time. Now we remove the remaining ones and they are not really tight because I kind of cheated on you guys. I kind of prepared it in advance. So. And here is that wheel bearing or the wheel hub as we call it sometimes, or the wheel spindle. Nothing really special. It is a bearing which is inside a piece of metal and then bolted onto the upright. This specific uh, spindle or wheel bearing is um, actually from a Fiat Panda. So I was able to trace it back. And uh, those of you that know a Fiat Panda, you know this is a very small car. The suspension on this car is actually built on a system which we call a wishbone and in this case, a double wishbone. And a wishbone is a frame in the, the form of a letter A. We have one in the top and one on the bottom, and it connects actually the upright, this is the upright, where the wheel bearing fits towards the chassis of the car, and it allows it to move up and down when you hit a bump. So it is almost kind of a parallel movement, but not in full. We'll talk more about this later. And this is the top ball joint, which is connecting the top wishbone to the top of the upright. And the same thing happens at the bottom side. And this is our bottom ball joint uh, connected to the upright and that allows the upright to move left and right once we turn the steering wheel. And the wishbone is called often an A-frame because it has the form of a letter A. And this rod here is not really part of the suspension as such but it relates to it. This is the rod that connects the upright towards the rack and pinion of the steering. And it's going to move the upright left or right, depending what kind of a curve we take. So it's important that all these ball joints are in a good condition, that we have no cracks in the metal or metal fatigue. So all this, we will take it apart and we will have to inspect it completely. 
And if you know a bit about suspensions, then you probably will say, well, you're missing something, Steve. And the part we are missing are the springs and the shock absorber. And that would be typically sitting right here, supporting the lower wristbone, and then connected on the top to the frame or the chassis of the car. And we don't have a shock absorber nor a spring in this area. And on this build, the shocks and the springs are installed at the inside of the vehicle. And there are two good reasons why you want to do this. The first reason is that it improves the aerodynamics. So if the shock and the spring is on the outside, then it's going to catch more wind, more drag. So it's better to have it inside so we improve the aerodynamics of the car. So that's the first thing. So that's one reason to move it inside the car. The second reason is that it is important to move the weight to the maximum possible extent to the center of the car that improves the balance and the handling of the car tremendously. So two good reasons to do that. However, there is a negative side to that. Shock absorbers absorb kinetic energy and convert it to heat by pushing oil back and forth through a little hole. And that heat uh, needs to be cooled down. And if you have it on the outside, then that shock absorber will cool down by the airflow. If it's inside, you have a bit of a problem. That's why you see often an oil cooling reservoir. But let us take the shock absorber system apart because there are some very important things we need to talk about. We need to talk about the spring rate and the wheel rate, very important factors for your suspension. And you'll see immediately why we have such a strong springs on this car and such a strong shock absorber for a fairly light car. And the shocks on this car operate on what we call a lever mechanism. And here we have a kind of aluminum cast lever, which is connected to the chassis. And a little bit further down, X distance, we have the connection to the shock absorber and the spring. And this is where the lever sticks out of the frame and then connects upwards to the top of the upright or the wishbone. So in other words, we have a pretty long lever. So let's measure the total length of the lever. And I know this is not going to be 100% accurate, but it's more than good enough for what I'm trying to explain. So this should be about 60, as you can see. The total length of the lever is 60. So remember that number. And we're also going to measure the distance between the pivoting point and the spring. And that is roughly about, well, let's say it's um, 16. On the board, I just drew the suspension system that we just verified on the car. And what we can see is that we have this alloy part, which is the lever, and it extends with that chrome bar all the way to the top of the wheel. And that whole arm is our lever. It has a pivoting point at the end connected to the chassis. And at some distance from the pivoting point, we've got the shock absorber connected. And we measured that to be 16. Now, for simplicity of the calculation, I said it's 15, because I just want to give you an idea on, on, on what this is all about. And then the distance between the pivoting point and actually the wheel was 60. So what you can see here immediately is that we have a ratio of 60 divided by 15, which is a ratio of 4. What that means is that if the wheel has been pushed up with a force of, let's say, 10, then that force will be multiplied along the lever and it will become 40 here. So the spring will have a lot of force onto it. Um, so what we say here is that the weight of the wheel exceeds by far, in fact four times, the weight of the spring. Also, if we move the wheel up one inch, then the movement here will be up one quarter of an inch. So that's how the suspension is working. Now you can see why we need a very heavy spring and not a very long spring because the movement is very small. The spring rate is what determines how strong the spring is and we'll take the spring apart and we put it on the press to see what the spring rate is on this because that suspension system is going to have a lot of force on it especially if you're going to get into a curve. Now there's other mechanisms to do this. 
uh, these toggle mechanisms so uh, whereby you can change the ratio. So the smaller the ratio you can get, the better it is for the spring, the smaller the spring can be, so the lighter the shock can be, and that's good. You could even use motorbike springs for that purpose, but then you would have to rebuild something different. In this case, the car is what it is, and I'm going to keep it as is, because I want to keep it original, and it's built like this. So let us take the suspension apart, and then have a look on the shock, and have a look on the spring. I removed the spring and the shock absorber and the lever from the car. This is the pivoting point. Here we have the shock absorber connection and then we have the rod going to the upright or the top of the whisk bone. And of course this is our shock uh, with the spring. And as you can see the ratios are pretty much different. I know in reality this is going up so it becomes a bit shorter. I have not calculated all the angles. That's not important right now. But as you can see um, this is why now we need this heavy spring. So let's have a closer look on the shock and the springs now. Here we are having the shock absorber and the spring. We call this a coilover. And I'm going to disconnect the spring now from the shock absorber. What you see here are rings and you normally can turn off these rings uh, and they move on this thread. This is what you need to preload uh, your suspension on your car. And let's see if I can remove it. I'm just going to undo all this so I can take the spring off. Later in another video we'll talk about uh, the preload and we'll actually do the preload because at the end of the day it is the spring which is actually supporting your car. Let me take the thing apart. It's not very difficult. Spring normally comes out very easily. And now we have the spring and the shock absorber. The whole purpose of a shock absorber is to dampen the oscillation of the spring because springs will kind of bounce if you have no shock absorber. So it's going to go like boing, 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 boing. And I'm sure you've seen cars where the wheel is bouncing on the ground just because of bad shocks. Uh, shocks come in different types and forms. This one is a Trax Spax uh, shock. Very good shocks and adjustable. Uh, this is the preload so you can tension up the spring by adjusting this and this will be for another video. On the top you have a bump stop and this is a bit damaged but okay. It means when the spring is completely compressed you don't get a hard shock on the shock absorber. You kind of buffer that with this foam here. I might have to replace this part but for the rest this shock absorber looks uh, pretty good. On the bottom I have a dial and, and I think this is kind of important. Normal shocks uh, that you find on road cars are typically dampening uh, when the spring is actually moving up. Some of them do it the other way around. And it's a fixed setting. You can't adjust the stiffness of the shock absorber. A race shock absorber allows you to adjust the stiffness. So how hard I need to push or extend it. And here you can see I have to push hard and pull hard to get it in and out. And that is because it's a two-way um, shock absorber. And on the bottom, I actually have a dial where I can adjust the strength of it. So I can go from very soft to very hard. So now this is a lot easier, as you can see. If I move it to the other way around, I'm going to place it to the maximum hardness. And I, really <laughs> I can hardly push. Uh, so let me turn that back a bit because... See, now I can push harder and it goes in both directions. Now the either, even better shock absorbers have actually a dial for the outward movement and the inward movement. You can adjust both. But on this car we only have it uh, in both directions at the same time, but we can adjust it. So some people believe that a very stiff suspension is good. Other people believe that a softer suspension is good. It really all depends on the track you're riding on and that's why you can adjust it. As you might have seen, the shock absorber is in a pretty good state, so I can reuse that. Now the spring is also in a very good condition. Now this spring is what we call a, a linear spring. The windings are all from the same distance. You have other springs that are proportional, so some windings are closer and, and, and they vary, so you have a varying force. The spring rate is uh, determined by how much weight you need to put onto the spring to depress it for one inch. And in Europe, how many kilograms you have to put on top of the spring or load it to depress it with one uh, centimeter. And if you depress it one inch with, let's say, 100 pounds, 
Well, for two inches, it will just be the double. That is what we call a linear spring, and this is what we have. It's pretty heavy. Uh, there's all kind of dimension aspects on a spring, the diameter and so on, the total length of the spring. But I don't know what the spring load is on this spring, so I'm just gonna put it on a press and see how much it is. We're going to measure more or less the spring rate and therefore I'm gonna put it on a press. And I will look on the dial on the top uh, how much pressure that is and I will depress it for an inch and um, an inch uh, let's see how tall that is for the moment so this is 15 and a half centimeters so roughly uh, that should take me down to 13 centimeters that's the kind of compression I want to do for the top of the spring and then I will know what the spring rate is I can see it on the top of the dial and then we'll have a look later on because I can't film both at the same time so let's compress it and see when we are at 13. Let me measure. We are at not 13 yet. Uh, a little bit more. Oops, it jumps away. Uh, almost there. Let's check it. Yeah, this is roughly 13. Let me check it on this side as well because that's where, yeah, a little bit more. <laughs> Now we got 13 and 13. If I look on the gauge, uh, and it's not a very accurate gauge, but I can see that the gauge has moved about one US tons. And you can see if I release it, you will see it drop. And here we go. So one US tons is the spring rate uh, for one inch on this spring. So, so far we have looked at the different parts that make up the suspension on this car. But we haven't looked at the most important things yet on how we can actually adjust the camber, the caster, and the toe-in, and the kingpin inclination on this car. So now we're going to look on how the upright is installed or connected to the wrist bones, and why does it have specific angles, and how did it do it, and how can I adjust it? The first thing we're going to look at is the ball joints on the top and on the bottom. And if I was to draw a line between them, like so, you can see that we have a certain inclination. So this whole rod is moving out a bit. And this is what we call the kingpin inclination. So it inclines inwards or it has an inclination outwards. And there's a very good reason why we have this. And this car has a certain inclination, as you can see. And here you might actually see it better if I draw the line like this, you can actually see that we have an inclination uh, towards the outside on the bottom. So what we have seen on this car is that we have a kingpin inclination which is going outwards. And that has a very special effect. You need to have that to have a self-centering effect on the wheels on the straight line. I'm going to put a rod here and I'll, through the center of the wheel. And I'm going to mark it right here on the top of the rim. See that? And now I'm going to turn the wheel and we'll see what happens with this mark, where the rim will end up. And that's just because of the angle. So let me turn that. You can see that the mark is now on the tire. The rim is about a centimeter lower. In other words, the wheel has been digging in to the tarmac if you turn it to the right and if you turn it to the left. And this is good because now we get more resistance when the wheels are not straight. So automatically the wheel will move to an automatic centering position. And that is important for straight line driving. So you need to have kingpin inclination outwards on the lower side. So what we have seen so far is that kingpin inclination improves straight line driving at high speed because the wheels have a self-centering effect. And the kingpin inclination is typically pointing outwards, like so. However, we can also move the kingpin forward and backward while having it actually pointing outwards, right? So we can do this. Now that is what we call caster. I'm sure that all of you know what this kind of a wheel is. This is what we call a caster wheel. 
Now, what is so typical about a caster wheel? It always rotates in the direction you push it. The wheel will trail. And if you look on that, there is always a fixing point right here. Right? This is where the fixing point is. But the center of the wheel, which is here, is there. So there is a difference between the two. And that's what we call the trail distance. And that is important. So you should always have a caster that is actually a such that the wheel trails the fixing point. So let's see what this wheel is doing. So the center of the wheel is behind the fixing point. So if I move this wagon this way, the wheel will just trail, see? However, if the center of the wheel is in front of the center point, so if I push the chariot back, see what happens with the wheel. It turns immediately because it wants to find that stable position. So the wheel is always wanting to trail. So what I've just shown you is the camber effect and wheels will always try to trail. Now, I'm sure that all of you have tried to drive a car backwards at high speed. And what did you notice? The car becomes very unstable. It's very hard to drive backwards on high speed. And even if you speed up even more, the effect will be that the car will go out of control. And that is because your front wheels are now in front of the pivoting point. If you drive forward, then the wheels are behind the pivoting point and then you get the caster effect. So let's have a look on this wheel here. If I place my white stick here along the uh, ball joints, then you'll see that the stick is actually pointing forward. And this is what we call positive caster. So the wheels on this car are actually trailing if I drive in the forward direction. I have the camera pointing downwards uh, on the wishbones, and this is the top wishbone, that's the lower wishbone. And as you can see, the lower wishbone sits far more forward than the upper wishbone. And this is creating positive caster. Positive caster improves straight line high speed driving because you have trailing wheels. But there's another side effect of it. So the kingpin inclination caused the wheels to dig into the tarmac if you were turning to the right, and it did the same thing if you were turning to the left. So now let's see what the effect of adding a caster angle is on the wheel. So let's mark it as we did before, and I have a very flat floor, so I'm not cheating. And let's see, through the center of the wheel, making sure we do it right. So the red mark here is where we have it on the rim, right? Oh, let's do that. So now, if I make a sharp left turn, what happens? Now, if I put my stick there, look at that. Look how much the wheel has now digged into the tarmac. That's a hell of a lot. And that's good, because this is the inner wheel. This wheel doesn't have a lot of force. All the force is on the outer wheel. So now, by digging in more, because of the caster and because of the um, ping, kingpin inclination, it's added up. Those two angles are added up, so we're getting a lot of down pressure on this tire. But let's have a look what happens if we turn to a sharp right. Here we go. Sharp right, let's check it out. Wow, sharp right. In fact, the wheel has gone up. And that's good, because if this wheel goes up, this is the wheel on a sharp right that is having all the forces on it. So it has already enough downforce on the wheel. And by moving up a bit, it actually shifts the weight to the inner wheel, which can benefit from the extra pressure because otherwise it's gonna lose too much grip. So that's the good thing about caster and actually kingpin inclination. You gotta find the right settings on the track and we'll do that once we get the car to the track. But there's one more thing I might have forgotten to mention to you about the kingpin inclination. So if you're going to raise a car, it's very important that you feel the suspension, that you feel the tires. And the best way to feel it is through the steering system. And that's where the kingpin comes in. 
So if this is the kingpin inclination, there is a distance between the kingpin and the center line of the wheel. If you have a huge inclination of the kingpin, then the kingpin is closer to the center line of the wheel. That distance is what we call the scrub radius. If the kingpin inclination is far less, then the scrub radius is a lot wider because the distance is further away from the center of the tire to the kingpin. The difference between the two is that if you have a large scrub area or scrub radius, most of the power or forces on the wheels are transferred through the steering system. If you have a large angle of the kingpin inclination, then most of the forces are transferred through the kingpin. So in other words, a kingpin with a large inclination angle is not going to give you a lot of good touch and feel with the car. You're not going to feel it too well on your steering wheel. So you want to have a minimum amount of inclination on the kingpin so that you can feel and sense the behavior of the suspension and the tires through the steering system. But be careful, don't make it too small, because if we make it too small, we're going to put so much stress on the steering system that we may actually destroy it. And the car can become pretty itchy as well if the inclination angle is too narrow. I think about one and a half to two degrees is probably enough, but this is something you need to check on the track. And this is why you have a lot of adjustments on the suspension on this type of cars. And we'll look on a few, but we still need to talk about one more thing, and that is the camber. Camber comes in two types. We have negative camber, when the wheels are pointing inwards on the top, and we have positive camber when the wheels are pointing out. And I'm sure you have seen both of them. Depending a bit on the um, suspension system, you have either negative camber or positive camber. Race cars, well, they always have negative camber, like I'm showing you right here. Of course, this is a bit exaggerated. And the reason for that is that you want to have firm grip of the tire under all circumstances. Camber is very important in cornering because you want to keep the surface of the tire, the complete patch, onto the tarmac. And when you turn right or left, it doesn't really matter, the car will roll. The suspension will move a bit, but the carcass of the tire will also shift under the load. So if I'm making a right turn, the outer wheels will get a lot of load and you'll see that the carcass of the tire will actually move out like so. So the tire sticks on the ground, but the rim is pushing it open. So what we want to do is to keep that wheel flat on the ground as much as possible. So we're going to give it an angle to begin with. And that angle is what we call the camber. So if you give it one and a half to one degree of camber, then under load while you're cornering, that whole system will become straight. So the wheel will be straight while you're cornering straight. And when I mean straight, it will be flat onto the ground. So you have a full contact patch. That is important in cornering because in cornering, you need to grip. On a straight line, it's a bit different. Because of the camber we'll have installed, you might be running a little bit on the edge here, on the inner edge of the tire. And if you look closely on this tire, you can actually see it's been running quite a bit on that. So um, all that you need to check on the track. So you do a couple of laps and then you measure the temperature on the different areas on the tire to find out how that camber and the kingpin inclination and the caster is helping you out. There are tools that you can use to measure the camber, but you should do it on a flat surface. And of course, what I'm showing you right now is not correct because I didn't align anything. But you will see that the little bubble will actually move if the suspension is changing, see? And I think that's the important part that you can see that although we create negative camber uh, under limited load, once we take a corner, uh, that actually suspension will actually uh, go up and it will compensate uh, for the deflection of the tire and the deformation of the suspension system. 
And then we have one last element we need to touch briefly. This is what we call toe in or toe out, but this is really more about the steering. So if the wheels are pointing inwards like so, and now I'm exaggerating, and both sides do this, this is what we call toe in. If the wheels are pointing outwards, we call it actually toe out. Now, toe in is something you want to adjust on a race car because both wheels will kind of plow together. They're going to improve straight line driving at high speed. And this is an adjustment you have to do on the rack and pinion on this tie rod right here. You can adjust these nuts and then you can adjust the toe in and toe out. Now, as I said, in most cases, we're going to go for toe in. So now that we have gone through all the geometry settings, we can now have a look on what is adjustable on this car and what is not. The ball joints are up here and below, and I have an adjustment with a couple of nuts uh, on both the bottom and the top that will allow me to move the upright more out or in. So that's a combination of my camber and my kingpin inclination. I can't really adjust the kingpin inclination separately from my camber. That doesn't seem to be possible because my wheel hub or my bearing is actually on the same mounting part as my upright. Now I probably could make some shims uh, on the side here and then make that adjustment so that would be possible. So that I can adjust. What I notice is if I move around this suspension have play here but also have play like this and of course this is something you don't want to have so this is something that needs to be fixed with additional washers and maybe I even have to get a new upper wishbone I'll see what after I've blasted it what the point is so we can adjust camber we cannot just the uh, kingpin inclination it's one setting unfortunately but what can we do about the caster can we do something about the caster let's have a look so it seems that I have caster adjustment. I can make this rod shorter, and if I do so, the whole lower wishbone will come more forward. And if it does that, then I increasing the caster angle. Uh, I can also make it longer, and then the whole wishbone will move backwards, and then I'm gonna have less caster. That is good. Uh, so in essence, I have two main adjustments. I have my caster, and I have a combination of my kingpin and my camber. Um, unless I would start using some shims on the bearing system. What else can we adjust? And we can adjust the toe in or the toe out by adjusting the steering rod on those two sides. So we just need to rotate this bar, but that's something for later. So overall, the ball joints are looking quite all right. Uh, we'll clean them up and see what shape they're in. Otherwise, we just get them replaced. Uh, they are not high cost items. I think they're in about 25 euros a piece, but you have like one, two, three, that's already 75. And then of course the uh, shock absorber linkage, that's another one. So yeah, it's probably about 100, 150 euros per site, which is not too bad because after all, steering is, uh, and suspension is uh, very important. Okay, the upright, well, that has known better days so we'll take it apart we'll blast it and then we go into repaint it and i'm going to do the same with all the wishbones so folks we're nearing the end of this video and all what's left for me to do now is to disassemble all these parts clean them up shell blast them and paint them and then i will rebuild the brake calibers uh, we'll put up the new master brake cylinders and you'll see all that when we reassemble this whole front part uh, and then we'll work on the back side of the car because in the back we also have a suspension and I have a bent drive shaft. So there's a little bit of work in the back as well. So I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I know this was a lot of theory, but that's what it is with suspension systems. Um, I just wanted to explain to you how this car is built and why they build it that way and what are all the adjustments that we can do on this car. So thank you for your views and Hopefully I see you back in one of my next videos. But the next one might probably be an old Rusty video because I have to keep my subscribers happy as well for old Rusty. Bye bye.